Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with the Dean. I'm Tony Stevens. I'm the Dean of the College of Business at Lipscomb University, and I'm honored today, we're particularly honored today, to welcome Daniel Day, Vice President uh, of IBM Global Services, to our campus here at Lipscomb. Welcome, Dan. Thanks very much. And we're, we really are honored to have you because you're one of the senior ranking executives of IBM globally. I know you have a daughter in school here. You spoke to a student group earlier today. I'm, I'm very interested in IBM. I think most of us think of IBM as a computer maker. Even CNBC calls it a computer maker when they announce earnings. And yet, I don't think that's accurate. And I also am fascinated by the fact that we've watched some of the iconic corporations of America go through bankruptcy, Kodak, uh, General Motors, American Airlines, and yet IBM is thriving today. First of all, what kind of business is it? And secondly, how did you do it? Great question. It takes uh, more than a couple of phrases to, uh, to answer that question, but it kind of goes back to the early 90s. In the early 90s, we were not doing very well. Uh, we were struggling. We were a big mainframe computer maker. That's all we did. Great research. Goes back 100 years. Our company is 101 years old this year in 2012. And, um, and it was struggling in the early 90s. And a fellow by the name of Lou Gerstner, I've had a pleasure to meet, came in as our chairman and CEO and uh, was a transformation agent. And he brought, he had the vision, which I think this is the genius, because if, uh, if companies could change, they already would have before a person like this comes on board. And when Lou came on board, he had a vision of transferring that, this iconic IBM company to a very profitable services-led or value-based delivery of solutions and hardware and software. And he had to start somewhere, so he started with the consulting business, and we started doing consulting and advisory around infrastructure. Now, all the way up to today, it's grown that that portion of our business, which I'm responsible for, partially responsible for, is a 15 to 16 billion dollar consulting firm of professional services. That's 100, 120,000 uh, consultants out of 450,000 uh, total uh, uh, IBM-ers. Uh, mm -hmm. We call them IBMers. And uh, but that's taken a long time from the early 90s to today, and that and the transformation continues. We've also he saw, uh, and I, I lay a lot of this on Lou's uh, desk, but, uh, but there were other people certainly involved, and he brought in a great team. Um, he saw that we were working as a multinational company, and we worked differently in Italy than we did in Spain, and different in Spain than we did in the UK and the US. And he worked to b build a vision that would take years to transform into a globally inter integrated enterprise. That was the vision. He wasn't really even sure what all that meant back then, because mm -hmm. nobody was really doing that kind of thing. So if you want to know how we've been able to go from, and I think the numbers are about right, we, we lost about eight billion in, two, in 92 or 91 uh, against about a $30 billion uh, top line revenue to today 100 billion. And one of the most profitable companies uh, of all of the Dow components on Wall Street. And as such, our stock today and you could say it's bragging, maybe it is. We're proud of this. Our stock is trading at an all-time high. Just as of this week, it's an all-time high. We're up well over 200% in, in, over the years through the recession. And we weathered through that. We weathered through uh, a lot of other uh, diversity within our uh, company of growing into other markets where we were not. But it, it started back, I would argue, on Lou Gerstner's desk. Mm -hmm. And uh, he even put out a book, if I, I may have the name of it wrong, but uh, Elephants Can Dance. And the theme of that was uh, that IBM was the elephant. How do, I, how do I make this elephant dance? And it was an amazing transformation. It, it's, you know, it's historic mm -hmm. these days. So, mm -hmm. so we as IBMers, we're very proud of that. So that's, you know, but it took you know, 18, 20 years. Now there are a lot of um, perceptions perhaps myths even about IBM. For example, people uh, laugh about the, 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 the letters IBM and say they stand for I've been moved. I think another uh, perception about IBM is that uh, you have to wear a white shirt. You're, I notice you're wearing yeah, a blue shirt I intentionally today. wore the, uh, uh, the uh, blue shirt. So I, I, I would assume that's no longer a rule. And yet when Thomas Watson founded the business and when he ran it for many, many years, uh, he created a, a very uh, specific type of culture. And it must have been very difficult for Lou Gerstner to come in and change a culture 
that was so well ingrained and also so large. So how did he do that? Did he do it by force of personality? Did he do it by being a genius? Well, uh, it's kind of a mixture. And people who are change agents for that large of a scale of enterprise, uh, they have to have a lot of attributes. Uh, they can't be just uh, the soft nature guy. They can't be all the tough nature guy. He was a mixture of all of those, but he also was brilliant. And he had a vision. And he was willing to take chances and calculated risks to move into markets that IBM had never been in before, but he saw potential in the marketplace. And so when those things start to take place and they start to show promise, when you're coming out of an almost bankruptcy in the early 90s, to starting to get some legs under that success, people join. People love to, to join in with the success. And so that's how cultures get built. But there was, there was a tremendous amount, and we talked about it earlier the, in today <clears throat> with the students. The character, and it's the word that I keep coming back to that IBM has, it's such a profound word, and it's pervasive through IBM, is that character underlying all of that change notion created trust because it takes a lot of trust and it takes a lot of ingenuity and takes a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, um, of your own personal pressing on day after day to, to create a change in a culture that size. Mm -hmm. It sounds nebulous, it sounds soft, it sounds subjective, it's all that. It's also objective. There's no question, we're a Wall Street uh, component of the Dow. The expectations are high. And when you're faltering the way we were in those days, <coughs> we were not favored. And now we're one of the top producing um, Wall Street components. And we're very, very proud of that. But we're also very maniacal about how you orchestrate that change. We're, we're not, uh, there, there are a lot of technology companies, there are brilliant technology companies, including Google and, and Apple that are out there that have really transformed businesses and transformed the way we live, you and I, the way we live. Absolutely. But IBM has been a bit more of a, um, um, a, a more of a, a I, it, I'll use my words, more of a, of, a, of a steadfast path of transformation with definite goals along those paths. All the while, this is what makes it really tricky and which is, uh, makes it more profound, is the fact that we've been able to do that and fi uh, financially sound. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to increase ourselves all the way through. Did we hit some, uh, some rough roads when the recession started hitting in late 2007? Heavy strokes in 2008, like a lot of people? Absolutely. But you ask the question, how did we survive perhaps through those times? Uh, that character word comes back into place but also our willingness and our ability to look at ourselves financially and be willing to make changes that were necessary to sustain our business growth. All the while, we never took our eye off of the goal of, of plowing forward into this, uh, uh, this services-led business. I, I want to talk about your business, which is the consulting business, but before we do that, let's just spend another moment or two and let's talk about computers in boxes because again, I think a lot of people continue to think about IBM in that context. I remember the first computer I ever personally bought was an IBM personal computer. I think they came out in 1982. My wife and I had just married and it was one of the first discussions, I'll say, that we had about finances. I felt it was absolutely critical for us to <laughs> own one of those. And it was quite a major purchase for a young couple, but we did, sure. we bought it and it was a box and I guess it's now in the Smithsonian Museum because it's probably the icon of early, <laughs> early Could computers. Uh, but that was what IBM was moving toward for, for a number of years after that. And yet Gerstner came along in the early 90s and said, no, that's not the direction we're going to go. And that turned out to be very smart because Dell Computer came later and, right. and totally upset the business. Now, of course, Apple has done the same thing. So how, how, did, how did he have that vision? Uh, how, how was he able to, to have that foresight? It, it's an interesting question. It, it's, it goes along the lines of, I got to use the word genius. Uh, I've met the guy, he's, he's more or less kind of a low key kind of guy, uh, but just e extraordinarily uh, focused. And somehow, and we have a lot of market researchers, so we get a lot of, of intelligence coming from the marketplace. But we were able to see like businesses who excel through difficult times or changes in product lines or changes in business lines, we were able to see somehow with Lou at the helm 
that the PC business was going to become highly commoditized. Mm -hmm. We chose fundamentally not to be in the commoditized business, but to be in a higher value bringing suite of services and products. So in order to do that, you got to take some steps. Some people would, and they said it at the time, why would IBM be selling off their PC business? All, everything, all the way, uh, laptops and everything. We sold all of that to the Lenovo company, a great company. Mm -hmm. Chinese company. Chinese company. Um, a friend of mine is the COO here mm -hmm. in the US. Mm -hmm. um, we saw it as commoditized. We did not see it fitting into the macro portfolio of our future. So we took the step. Not everybody does. There are those who take those steps and fail. And we took them and we succeeded. And so IBM moved into a services environment as opposed to a products environment, and a portion of those services uh, are, are the, is the consulting business that you're responsible for. Most people don't realize that IBM as a consulting company is actually larger in terms of revenues than, let's say, Accenture, which is probably more often thought of as a consulting business. Right. So tell us about the consulting part of IBM. How big is it? How how, sure. how, how much does it operate globally? Well, I'll give you a, a quick history on that. Um, Lou Gerstner started it, and it started out with infrastructure designers and those kind of people, you know, around the hardware business mm -hmm. that existed at the time. But he also saw great value because he came from McKinsey Associates, the, the great uh, strategy firm, and they're still, the, in, in my mind, the greatest strategy firm in the world. He came from that environment, so he saw the value in advisory and counsel around whether it be software implementations, which are a huge part of our business today, which require all kinds of business expertise to implement those solutions and trans using those as transformation tools in, in companies. But um, you know, it didn't do all that well. It did okay, but there were great competitors like Ernst & Young and PwC Consulting, and then later on Arthur Anderson, and then Anderson Consulting, and then after Enron and all that happened, Accenture, mm -hmm. which is all now Accenture, tremendous firm. And, Del and uh, Deloitte Touche Consulting, and which is now just called Deloitte Consulting, all great competitors of ours to this day. But we saw those as examples of what we could be. So, uh, you know, I've been with the firm uh, now in the 12th year, and in my second year, uh, I was at a roundtable meeting in Armonk, which is where our world headquarters are. And, New York, and, Ar 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 Armonk, New, New, Ar mm -hmm. Ar Ar New York, and uh, Jenny Rometty, who's just recently, as the first of the year, took over as uh, the new uh, CEO for um, IBM Worldwide, from Sam Palmazzano, who's now sitting as a chair. Uh, she came over to our roundtable. So, well, what's you know, what's she coming over to ask us? And she asked us this question. It was a bunch of us partners in this in this firm that wasn't doing all that well, but we saw this great potential, but it's really big. She asked the question. She says, "Who would you acquire?" If you could acquire anybody today, who would you acquire? Well, uh, no offense to, uh, to my colleagues that, are, that we did acquire, I said uh, Deloitte Consulting. Great firm, it happened to be in the industry that I was in at the time. And um, so long story short, uh, that turned out to be a question that uh, the, the uh, check mark went by the PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting. And so in 2002 and three, we acquired PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting uh, and, um, and they were, on the ropes a little bit. It's post year 2000 and a lot of the consulting firms were, were, were staggered a little bit, but year 2000 wasn't a big uh, problem and they had done very well prior to that. So, you know, they were, um, they were a target for acquisition. Well, when we acquired them, we really became a world-class professional services firm because the, the Pricewaterhouse Coopers Consulting had such great depth of experience that went back 100 years and these people all came out of most of them came out of accounting or most of them were finance based finance based people and that's what's now uh, our global business services now Dan when when I think of consulting I think of a variety of types of projects a company says well I've got a problem with this help me solve it when I think of PwC consulting I think of things that are tied to accounting types of projects or perhaps finance projects how, where does IBM add value, given the fact that you're still at your core a technology company? What would be a typical client? What would be a typical project? Well, there's, there's hardly any of the Fortune 500 that we don't have engagements of, of one fashion or form with. And um, we learned, and this goes back to Lou Gerstner, he understood somehow with vision that it was uh, an imperative to understand how business technologies could support business. 
but you could not implement business technologies without significant business experience like a PWCC could bring. And so when we brought those folks in, we melded together our expertise of business technologies with a business process expertise, which made a profound difference in the marketplace because every client, each one of those Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 50 companies that we do business with, they require that. And they, they've now through all the years come to understand the business technologies are paramount in their business. They, they're an absolute dependency of how they do business on a daily basis, whether they're transacting uh, a product that you buy and scan at, uh, at Walmart, to how that transaction hits the general ledger, to how that creates a reorder through the process, all from an integrated perspective, requires a tremendous amount of business technologies, like the use of integrated softwares like SAP, which we're a, a strong partner with, they're one of our business partners, as well as the Oracle Corporation. And we're a large user of that SAP product as well, but it's an integrated enterprise that works. And that's what makes a lot of the difference in the marketplace. I can tell you, I can name you 20 clients that use these technologies, understanding that they want to move into different marketplaces, so they've got to contain their costs of operations with, with better business technologies. Or, qu quite frankly, I've worked with a lot of clients before that, that want to see themselves in a better light for acquisition. Mm -hmm. So they want to upgrade their business technology so they're more attractive because nobody wants a company with a broken technology um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, infrastructure. Now we're, we're sitting today in Nashville, Tennessee, which is the healthcare services capital of the country, maybe the world, I guess you mm -hmm. could certainly argue the United States. I think there are about 300 healthcare companies that are based here. And when I think of technology, I think of technology as the the chief challenge of healthcare management companies uh, trying to get access to electronic medical records and right. integrate all of those into the practice uh, of medicine. Are you involved in that? Are you making a major push into electronic medical records and health informatics? Uh, the industries, and we go to market by industry vertical. So I'm within an industry that focuses on companies like um, here in town or uh, um, uh, major airlines or major uh, freight uh, companies. So it's not particularly where I focus. However, I've run, have had practice areas before that had healthcare as a particular industry focus. We have an entire group within Global Business Services that focuses on nothing but healthcare. Those people, absolutely, that's at the absolute top of the list. And we meld that together, whether it's electronic medical recording throughout the integrated process, all the way with doctors, and providers and payers uh, with what we're calling Smarter Planet because as we discussed a little bit earlier, we believe that there's data in everything and the integrated part of that and the way that you integrate that data creates value for you as a business, how you make decisions, how that doctor will make decisions and how they do it instantaneously mm -hmm. and have that ready information which could be life critical. And so IBM is making absolutely. a major move into electronic Absolutely. It, it's an interesting thing. It's like with a lot of business change. That's a business change. Yes, it's catapulted and, 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 and driven by business technologies, but as we own businesses, sometimes we're not willing to change. We have to be willing to change. We have an entire group that helps coach our clients mm -hmm. on how to accept change. We all go through that as, as, as human beings. Companies do, it the, do the same thing. So that you have to convince yourself that you want to move into medical recording that's integrated, that you're not fearful of it, that security is now so ironclad that I don't have that as a worry anymore. Ten years ago it probably was. Mm -hmm. But the evolution of that is absolute and, and certainly in the Nashville area with all of these uh, healthcare providers and payers um, and, and all the periphery companies that supply those, um, it's coming. Now, you made a comment to our students this morning about a particular company. I won't name the company, but it's a very, very large business. And you said even a company of that size struggles with the integration of data. Data is siloed. And I, I know that I've experienced that in, in many different settings, and I think we struggle with that in higher education. People know about what they're responsible for, but they don't sure. often share that, share that data. So is that part of what you do? Do you help companies figure out how to share that data? And do you have any advice for, for companies or educational institutions on how they might de-silo the data? Well, quite frankly, <laughs> I, yeah, well, and, and that's a good way to put it, and we use that term quite a bit. 
Uh, I would not differentiate uh, uh, an educational institution like Lipscomb from another company down the street. The, the, the information flow, not just bits and bytes, it's not technical, it, it's, it's a matter of information that one makes decisions on. That you make a decision on today, I might make a little bit different decision on the same data. And how does that data work between us and, and is it real? Is it accurate? Where did it come from? Is it old? All of those things boil up to us making poor decisions for our businesses and for the institution here. It's the way that it is. Until you get to an integrated enterprise where that information flow is available to you and it's trusted as accurate and it's built in such a way that it comes to you in such a way, and I'll use the term dashboard, which I'm a huge proponent of. Mm -hmm. I go back to the old balanced scorecard methodologies. Mm -hmm. I love to create uh, financial dashboards for our CFOs because it allows them to, to create that dashboard to, to, to help them uh, with decision making. I need this information here, you may need something totally different. So absolutely, we advise our clients that the best way to integrate that enterprise is to look at your business processes first, and quite frankly, I always equate it to my, what, my, what is my five-year business plan for my business, or the university? Where's the university gonna be in five years? Where do I want it to be? What do I see are the, step, are the steps to get there? And what can I do from a business technology which is guaranteed to be a component of, of that enablement, what do I need to do to, to integrate that? Dan, let me move to a slightly different area. We're, we're, we're gonna run out of time here in just a few minutes, and I wanna touch on ethics and integrity because I think one of the things that IBM has done right, very, very right, has been to create a culture of high integrity. And in our environment, uh, in this country today, I think we're struggling with that. Uh, all you have to do is read the headlines in the newspapers to see that there are companies that, that struggle with that, and individuals. How, how has IBM done that? Uh, I'll tell you, it, it's the people. It sounds cliche, it's the people. It's, it's all you have. It's not the hardware we build. That doesn't create character and integrity or high degree of ethics. It could be the best running hardware or computer, supercomputer on the planet like Watson, it's been in the news. It comes down to people. It, it's a culture that, that has been born and bred many, many years ago, 101 years old this year. It started then with the Watson family, and it's still there today. How it stayed there, I'm just pleased that it has. There's companies that, that choose to stay on those paths, and companies that do not. And I'm very, very proud of the way that we have. How we've gotten there is just a day, it's a day-to-day -day thing. Every decision that you and I make as IBMers has to be one of, of high degree of character, and I'm very, very proud of that. And it's so deeply inculcated into the culture that it becomes almost impossible not to be a person of integrity within the IBM family. Is that a fair it's, statement? It's kind of the way you should look at it. Yeah, really, it's, you know, 450,000 person family. Uh, but, and, and, and think about this, it even is more complex because we're in so many different countries. Mm -hmm. Maybe countries that are challenged much differently economically or culturally than we are here in the United States or here in Nashville. How does that stay consistent? We have a nice set of guidelines, but they're guidelines. You and I have to act on those guidelines. It comes down to the people. Does it also include recruiting? Uh, do you, Absolutely. Do you do things differently when you recruit someone than maybe another company or firm would do in order to ensure that you have that continuity of commitment to integrity? Well, we do. I mean, you know, I've done a lot of recruiting in our professional services, and we look for people of, of high character and, and, quite frankly, you know, of high intellect and, and high energy. But everybody would say they do that. Everybody says they do that, and it's a matter come down, it comes down to choosing so well. So how do you ensure that you do that? I don't know if there's a way you ensure it. You, you, you learn to choose well. You choose as well as you can throughout that recruiting process. And I hate to use the word hope for the best, but if, you, if you're doing it on, uh, on, uh, on some good empirical data, and some good backgrounding, I think you make some good choices. We've been fortunate. Well, you actually- It's not absolute by any, way, by any means, but it's, uh, it's, I would argue that it's culturally still in all in the right direction. Character is at the mainstay of our success. We blend that right into our success. Our, all the way to the character that we put in front of our clients, that we are on, on, on a path with every single client to ensure that their business is better, 
by the fact that we came by. You, you spoke this morning to our Student Center for Public Trust, which is uh, essentially an ethics club within the university. We were very proud to have the first of those in the entire United States. There are many across the very country impressive. today. Uh, we think it's part of our mission here at Lipscomb, uh, so thank you for speaking to the students. But you told the story this morning of a uh, colleague at IBM who had backdated a contract by just a couple of days in order to get it into a prior period and thereby earn a bonus not just for himself but also for his team. Right. And I believe I recall that you said that person was terminated from their employment at IBM because it was against the policy. Uh, to do that. Tell that story and, yeah. and is that one of the ways that IBM perpetuates the culture by having a, a zero tolerance uh, of that sort of thing? Right and it's not a brutal thing. It could be perceived as being just brutal. It's not at all. It's the mainstay of character. That person in that instance and I, and I was you know I was right there. I saw how it all happened uh, after the fact. We learned about this you know and as part of uh, my overall team. Uh, I was on a leadership team with this fellow and that contract came in a couple of days past the end of the quarter. And we're a public company, so it's very driven by the end of the quarter and setting the right expectations for Wall Street, which is part of the reason why we're successful in the marketplace. And that contract, for whatever reason, was expected to be signed at the end of the month, and it got signed a couple of days afterwards. And the client was willing to backdate it, no cost to them, but is a huge integrity cost to the, to the IBMer who was willing to do it and they chose poorly. And they were terminated as soon as that information was made, uh, made aware to us. Dan, we, we really only have time for one more question, but let me ask sure. you about careers at, uh, at IBM uh, Global Services, uh, not only for the benefit of our students, but I'm sure we'll have many viewers who will see this who uh, are not necessarily students here at Lipscomb, but perhaps are interested in careers. Uh, how would one go about applying to become a consultant at IBM Global Services? Great question. Uh, again, we have 120,000 consultants worldwide. We go to market by industry vertical. So if, if you're a student, if you're an undergraduate student, you're, you may not know what industry you might want to work in, or per perhaps your parents or some business that you might have been associated with happens to be in the automotive industry. Then the best way to do that is get to know someone at IBM. We have certainly a, an, a huge website that allows students or experienced uh, folks who are interested in the firm uh, to put in their resume in there. But I, I will tell you, uh, in, a, in a large company like ours, not unlike many businesses, it's best to know someone. And, and when you do, it, it gives you a great advantage. And, uh, and we're absolutely as hungry as, as you could be to grow. Uh, we're continuing to hire. We've hired straight through the recession, although we had a lot of adjustments to that. We tuned out a lot of our services, and, and, um, uh, but we're still hiring and we're still growing. So a great way to do it is one of two ways. You could either look at the website or reach out to someone like myself. And you really excited our students this morning when you said that there were opportunities uh, if you wanted to live in Ireland or if you wanted to live sure. in Asia, you could find opportunities within IBM for those kinds of careers. You absolutely could. And if, if you're so inclined, let's say you, you know, you've always dreamed of living in China. Tremendous opportunities. And we love to have folks from different countries working in different countries. Not all Italians working in, in Italy, mm -hmm. but we like to have the mixture of that because we have a huge value. Keep in mind, we're, a, we're a truly an integrated global company. We act like one company around the globe. And as such, a person who lives in Nashville could greatly benefit in the IBM company by working in Ireland or working in Asia or Singapore or New Zealand or Australia or uh, Vienna or wherever they might want to live. There's opportunities in all those places. They come and they go as demand increases and, and retracts, uh, but those opportunities are there, and it's tremendous for, for young folks. Well, thanks for being here today, Dan. My it's, pleasure. Uh, it's an honor not only to have you on the campus, but we're uh, honored to have your daughter as one of our students here, and thank you for coming to Nashville, and thank you for being on our campus. Today. My pleasure. Enjoyed it. We're honored to have you. My guest today has been Daniel Day, who's the Vice President and a partner at IBM Global Services. We appreciate you joining us and hope you'll join us again soon for Conversations with the Dean.